In a few seconds, we'll have the opportunity to meet many of the, sc of the stars of that film who are here, <laughs> who will be talking about immigration. But one of the other very, two very important ways that we tell the stories at the Tenement Museum are through our educators who bring these family stories uh, to life for you, as, as you heard about here, and as I'm, I hope many of you have experienced or will experience, and also through objects. Um, again, later in the evening, I'll show you some video clips of more of the, the residents of 103. Um, but when we actually give the tours in 2017 or 2018, they won't be there with us giving the tours, but we use images and we use objects especially to kind of help evoke and help bring stories together. So part of this larger endeavor is not only the creation of a bricks and mortar apartment here at 103, that won't be ready until 2017 or 2018, but we're also creating a virtual tour. So we're going to be able to start telling a lot of these stories um, in the next year. Um, and so binding all of this together are in many ways objects. And we're interested in how your story becomes our story by having and, and inviting people to have objects that start to tell their story and will be featured on the website. To give you a sample of this, we asked some of our wonderful educators to do this, and we also asked our visitors, and at the end of the program you'll hear from a visitor who has put together his own object story, but we'll start now by inviting Christina Chan, an educator at the Tenement Museum, to share her story. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, hi everybody. So what I'll do is I will read my story and then kind of explain some of the things that you're seeing. Um, the object that you're seeing, these kind of FOTGO tins, uh, and who's in that photo next to it. So as a traditional holiday treat, FOTGO are made for Chinese New Year. FOT translates to fortune, and these sweet treats are meant to bring luck for the New Year. These tins were used by my great-grandmother and passed on to my grandmother. Although I don't have too many memories of my great-grandmother, I have many of my grandmother making these in her kitchen. She would always make them with the batter, make the batter using the same ladle and bowls. She would then spoon them into each tin and we would wait for them to steam up in the wok. When they were done, they would resemble little muffins that bloomed triangular peaks. The more they were pointed, the more she said they were filled with fortune. As they cooled, I would pick off the tops because they were my f most favorite and most fun part to eat. We still use these tins every Chinese New Year to make fat go. However, over time, as I have learned to make them, come to understand how simple yet difficult they are to actually make. The process can't be modernized or rushed as I would like it to be. But these tins are an annual reminder that the traditions of my family require time and patience. So what you're taking a look at is uh, the FOTGO tins in kind of a basket that steams. And in the photograph next to it, uh, that's small version of me in, in my grandmother's lap. And next to her is her, her mother, so my great grandmother. And so this is the paternal side of my family. Uh, I was actually talking about FATCO yesterday with somebody, so they're kind of this blend, if you can imagine, a spongy version of a popover and a muffin. That's something. But yeah. Okay. It's sugar and gluten, essentially. Yes. Right. Yeah. So. And then, um, thank you very much. And now, um, Jason Eisner, who not only is an educator here at the museum, he is the man who hires and trains and does everything to manage all so much of what we do here at the museum. So Jason Eisner is going to share an object from his family. Um, Jason Eisner from Chicago. <laughs> do, I, do I advance the slide? Or? This wooden camel was part of a caravan that traveled along my granny's uh, living room windowsill. My brother and I used to play with these desert nomads whenever we visited granny, but were always cautioned to do so with the utmost respect. 
These camels represented our grandpa, who died before we were born. Everything I know about him came through stories. He was the second son of the Saad family, Lebanese and Syrian immigrants, who carved out a life for themselves in the flatlands of suburban Illinois. Suburban Illinois, not Chicago. <laughs> <clears throat> Although he was named Edward, everyone called him Eddie. Looking through a scrapbook filled with letters, it was clear that he was wildly in love with my granny. He called her Yaka, a name which my granny adopted and abbreviated, signing all of her le return letters, Love Yak. <laughs> Grandpa spoke Arabic with his family, who lived in the house behind the fence. Legendary arguments were carried out along that. Uh, along the boundary between the fence and that house, all of it in Arabic, yet he never passed that language down to his children, not even the curse words. By all accounts, Grandpa was a simple, solid American boy who went to church and fought in the war, raised a family, and worked for the railroad. He was a dark-skinned man who made a point of passing. There in a little house in Westmont, Illinois, his family's desert past faded into a suburban middle American present. Little remains of that past, uh, but for this wooden camel. Over the years, it grew to prominence as a symbol of my family's estranged Arab roots. Now, as it travels along my Brooklyn windowsill, I imagine myself atop the camel's hump, searching a desert horizon for the oasis of my family history, wishing I knew more. Um, so thank you, Jason and Christina. And I think both of these stories, Christina grew up in Queens and Jason grew up in suburban Illinois, um, show the way in which immigrant roots inform the way we decorate our homes, the way we remember our childhood, the tastes that we think about. And my instinct is that everyone in this room has a story like this and this is our goal in part in doing this exhibit we're not only going to be telling the stories of the people upstairs as important and as solid and as exciting as those stories are we want to figure out a way as a museum that we can become a repository for all of America's immigrant and migrant stories so we'll get back to this but before we do I want to talk about another element of how we do our research, and that is relying heavily on the research of um, academics, um, historians in the past, and increasingly now as we go to the more recent past, to sociologists and anthropologists um, who can help tell us about the families that, that we're studying. Um, and the NEH grant that we have, the grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, allows us to work very closely with them to not only read their books, but to have them teach our educators, to have them listen to us tell our stories, and to have them you know, tell us when we're heading in the right direction or also the wrong direction with things. Um, so tonight, you are going to now be privy to hearing about their work. Um, I'm going to introduce three of them all at once, and they'll come up one by one to, to give you a, just a 10-minute overview of some of their work. And then afterwards, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the 103 residents, and then we'll, you'll see us having a discussion together, seeing how we piece it all together. Um, so we're going to hear from Nancy Foner, a professor. Uh, all of the three academics are professors at the CUNY Grad Center here in New York. Um, Nancy Foner, who is the author and editor most recently of one out of three, a book which is exceptional and is available for sale at our store at a 15% discount tonight, and she will sign that for you. Um, and also a contributor to that work and many others edited by Nancy and, and his own um, is Bill Kazanitz. Um, my favorite book is Inheriting the City, but there are many, many more that he has written and co-edited. Um, and also Margaret Chin, um, and she is the author of Sewing Women, again, also a professor at the CUNY Grad Center. So they'll be coming up one by one to tell you a little bit about their work and how it connects to the Tenement Museums. 
Thank you, Annie. I love working at the Tenement Museum and coming to the museum, talking to the educators, being involved in the exhibit. It's very exciting and a great privilege. Um, so thank you. Um, so I think one of the, just picking up on something that Annie said as a way to get into this is when she said, you know, people have their own stories. And actually one of the reasons why so many New Yorkers have their own stories about immigration is because so many New Yorkers are actually either immigrants themselves, children of immigrants, or grandchildren of immigrants, or great-grandchildren of immigrants, and then you have the vast majority of New Yorkers. So actually immigrants know, very close to uh, and important in the life of New York City. So what Annie asked me to do, right, is uh, talk about 120 years of immigration to New York City in 10 minutes. So I'm going <laughs> to try. Well, okay, we start with Ellis Island, starting with the Ellis Island era, okay, which is what I, have, in looking at the 20th century, you've got bracketed the immigration of the first you know, part of the 20th century, which was a Russian, Jewish, and Italian immigration. You have the latter part of the 20th century, the new immigration, as I talk about in one out of three. Um, and then in between, there's a, a big intern, what I would call a big internal migration. So I want to talk about all three of those to set the stage, and also to set the stage for looking at the apartment. So this earlier wave, okay, which began, it roughly in the 1880s and lasted until the mid 20s, 1920s, brought millions of Jewish, uh, Russian Jewish and Italian immigrants to the city. Migration, this massive wave from, uh, from Eastern and Southern Europe was over by the mid-20s, mainly because of restrictive legislation, federal legislation in 19, that went into effect in 1924, which established for the first time national origin quotas and greatly restricted the ability of Eastern European Jews and Italians to come, and then also in addition to the legislation, there was a depression, so people were not dying to come to the US because there were no jobs. And also, of course, after that, World War II. And after decades of restrictions, the US opened its gates again in 1965. It eliminated these national origins quotas that had favored Northern and Western Europeans. And now family reunification, and to a lesser extent skills, became the basis for, getting, uh, for, for immigrating to the US. The big winners in New York were Asians, although we've heard from Margaret already in the film, right? Asians were already restricted very greatly from immigration even before 1924, particularly the Chinese, where their first Asian the Chinese Exclusion Act was in 1882. But the 1965 law made it possible for the first time for massive Asian immigration again. And in the New York area, also people from the English-speaking Caribbean were benefited from that, from the 1965 law. There were also in the New York, the refugee law in the New York, in the New York City, Soviet Jews were big, were, were a group that came in because of refugees, they entered as refugees. And the diversity visa program, which was established in 1990, it was established to give people who had, who came from countries that there were very few immigrants in the US, so they couldn't use family reunification to get here because they didn't have family here. Um, that this was passed, and there are 55,000 diversity visas every year. 
and in a lottery, they're given out. And um, this led to new flows into New York from African countries, from Bangladesh. And once you had you know, a core of people coming, they provided the seed for larger communities. As these indicate, um, uh, immigration law has been very important in, un in, in, uh, in understanding why immigration has ebbed and flown at various points. But in some cases, there are clearly other factors. I'm just going to mention them. Exit policies in countries. <laughs> some people couldn't leave, right? And the two behemoths here are the Soviet Union and China, where people couldn't, at various points, they weren't able to leave. Uh, and so the change in exit policies made it also policy, po possible for them to come. And of course, we cannot forget the role of political and economic forces in the countries of origin, which are absolutely crucial in motivating people to leave, to want to seek a better life in the US, to earn more money, to have a better standard of living. So New York City, that's the, we've gotten now to 65, but we have to go back a little bit because New York City was also on the receiving end of what we might call a big internal migration, which actually in the, in the mid 20th century. And people often forget this because they think, well, there was this migration, immigration of Jews and Italians early in the 20th century. There's this massive wave of Asian, Latino, and Caribbean immigrants coming in post 65, but actually there were a lot of, well, there are all, there, people are always coming to New York, but there was this migration, very significant migration, which changed the racial and ethnic makeup of New York in very dramatic ways in the mid 20th century. One migration was from the American South of African Americans, and that began around World War I and continued into 1960. It, historians talk about it as the great migration because it led to a, 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 blacks had been bottled up in the South mostly before that time. And it led to a spread uh, of the black population throughout the country and into the North. And New York received a lot of black, uh, African American immigrants, in, internal migrants, right? I'll call them migrants. Betw um, Puerto Ricans. Now you can say, why are Puerto Ricans in here? Aren't they immigrants? Well, officially they're not immigrants. If you're born on the island of Puerto Rico, you are a US citizen. And therefore, Puerto Ricans can come and go. So that we saw um, in the film, the, the, the super of the building, right? He and his, his family came in the 1950s. There was a huge Puerto Rican, um, I, can, I can't remember what's on the slide there. Okay, you've got the figures there. There was a huge Puerto Rican migration into the, into the city uh, from starting in the really in the in the 1940s, 1950s, going into the 60s, that was the heyday of the Puerto Rican migration. Um, you can see in 1940 there were 61,000 Puerto Ricans in New York City. By 1970, it was 847,000, and you can see 60% of all the Puerto Ricans in the United States. So New York was a major destination for Puerto Ricans. In the first two, now these are the figures again, Margaret alluded to, actually Margaret said that in her, when she, the little quote right in the film that you saw, was that in 1920, New York City was a city of Europeans, you know, European immigrants and their children and grandchildren. 97% of New Yorkers were of European origin. That's huge, right? By 1960, more than one-fifth of the population was black and Hispanic, and that was largely due to the migration of Puerto Ricans and African Americans. There were some West Indians who came in the early part of the 20th century, but really their numbers are dwarfed by the numbers of African Americans who came in. Um, and so this was um, a very, very big, a big change. In fact, um, I like to think about um, well, oh, I have some figures before, but I'd like to think about, you know, oh, there's one out of three, right? Okay. Um, I like to think about the Glazer and Moynihan, you know, Beyond the Melting Pot, which was written in 1960, and they talked about the ethnic groups of New York being Irish, Italians, Jews, they call them Negroes, and Puerto Ricans. And that was 1960, and that sounds like ancient history, right? Because that has, again, been totally transformed by this new immigration. And you could see, again, just to give you some figures on how the new immigration or the immigration of the past 50 years has changed the racial and ethnic composition of, this, of New York. In 1980, whites were still a majority of the population at 52%. Their, number, their percentages kept on going down. Um, and, but by 2010, whites were 33% of the population of New York City. Hispanics were 29%, blacks 24%, and Asian 13%. And actually, I think the number now is 14% for Asians. It's gone it's even since 2010. 
but even the groups within each of those categories have changed. So his Puerto Rican, we don't, you know, in, in 1960, people didn't use the term Hispanic. It was Puerto Ricans, right? <laughs> that was the, the, okay? And Puerto Ricans are now, a, they're still a significant proportion of the Hispanic population, about a third. There are 700,000 Puerto Ricans in New York. That's a lot of people. However, they are outnumbered by a combination of Dominicans, Mexicans, Ecuadorans, Colombians, and other Latin Americans. Asian no longer means Chinese. Now, the Chinese are by far the largest group of Asians. However, there are also large numbers of Asian Indians, Koreans, Filipinos, increasingly Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Um, the black population, and I should say one of the interesting things about New York is that New York has not, that 24% of the population of New York City is, is non-Hispanic black. Most cities in the nation, it's the black population has shrunk and Hispanics have really, really overtaken them. The reason that that's not true in New York is because New York has received a large black immigration. In fact, the black, as I have here, the black population has been Caribbeanized. About a third of the black population has origins in the Caribbean and increasingly Africanized. So that um, the black, each group has been affected and changed. I didn't talk about whites, but whites have also been changed by because <laughs> we have a, a, a significant proportion of the white population also have are, are immigrants from Europe, from the former Soviet Union, from Poland, from Eastern Europe. Um, so, okay, my time is up. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I've done a very quick survey. I just want to say one more thing, right, and then I'll end. Uh, you know, I have here my little mantra about New York always being changed by immigration, and you get that, I think. But I think also if we're looking at 103 Orchard Street in the apartment that's going to be, that is upstairs, that's going to be part of the museum, um, we're looking again at this middle period, and so we should think about that's an interesting period in New York when you have the Russian and Jewish immigration is over, right, in the mid-20th century. You have the Russian and Jewish immigrants are working age adults and getting older. Uh, their children and grandchildren are growing up. Um, and they're leaving, if we look at the Lower East Side, they're leaving the Lower East Side. They're moving to the outer boroughs and they're moving to the suburbs. And so then you get, not African Americans are not coming to the Lower East Side, they're going elsewhere, but you have Puerto Ricans moving in large number to the Lower East Side. And then what you have now <laughs> is you have new populations coming in or nearby, Margaret will be talking about the Chinese whose numbers have been growing enormously. And so you have, um, and I guess we can also say if we look at this middle period, we can say it's on the brink of a big change that nobody in that period would ever have imagined would have ever happened because, of course, even Glazer, even Nathan Glazer and Daniel Moynihan didn't predict it. If you read their book, they had no idea when they were writing this thing was published in 1960 that this huge immigration was going to occur that was going to transform the country and transform the city and ultimately transform the Lower East Side. So on the, that note, <laughs> I will leave and we could <laughs> Thank you. And I realize it's a terrible thing to make people who have written thousands and thousands of pages on a topic come and do this in, in 10 minutes. So I really, this is, this is like the Olympics of academics. Um, and now um, Phil Kazanis is going to come up. Those of you who know me know what a challenge it is for me to do anything in 10 minutes. So, and Several of you were here last time I spoke. So I've got to think of new things to say. This is a problem. Um, I, let, let me just pick up on some. I'm, I'm always very, very pleased uh, to speak at the Tenement Museum. And in part, that's because perhaps more than any other institution in the city, the Tenement Museum really connects past and present and this issue of immigration. And part of the mission of the museum and one of the things that it's accomplished is by making history real uh, and making it tangible, they've made that connection. First, perhaps, a connection for many of us between our immigrant roots and our present situations. But more recently, and I think particularly with the move into 103, to sort of also move up historically into that uh, middle period, because it is an ongoing story. Let me just pick up on uh, something that Nancy was saying. Um, the period that and, and I must say, for many of us, this is, is since the, uh, the period that's represented by 97 is really out of living memory for most of us, right? 
So it, it, it does tend to get mythologized into that immigrant past and those black and white Lewis Hine photographs of the Lower East Side and everything. But we're now moving into a period that at least some, not all of us, but some of us are old enough to actually, you know, have some real connection to. And I must say the um, first moment when I actually was in the apartment that it's really struck me was the fact that number one, even though it was the Lau family apartment uh, occupied by a Chinese family for many years, how much it looked like, you know, my grandmother's apartment. And how much it smelled like my grandmother's <laughs> apartment. And I was trying to do this Proust thing, was saying, now what is that? What is that? I was getting all these flashbacks at being five years. Of course, eventually I figured out it was camphor. You know? <laughs> the, the mothballing of everything, you know? <laughs> But I think that this connection, past and present, um, really brings out some very important parts about this middle period. Now, on the one hand, as Nancy was saying, the middle period uh, of the mid-20th century is a period in which uh, actual international migration is quite low. It's the only period in its history where New York's population essentially stabilized. In fact, one decade, the 1970s, actually went down slightly. It's also uh, the only period in which this neighborhood's population was actually in decline. Okay. So this was a period in which, I mean, if you think about it, in 97, the landlord actually shut up the building and stopped renting apartments you know, in, in the, at, in, during the Depression. What a remarkable thing in New York, the idea that you'd actually have an apartment and not rent it. I mean, so it was an unusual period. And of course, there was the construction of the public housing. There was the expansion of the outer boroughs. But people tended to be leaving. And it was the one period in the history of this neighborhood where population was really going down. On the other hand, just because nobody's coming doesn't mean nobody's coming. Um, and as Nancy pointed out, it was a period of large migration of American citizens from Puerto Rico and the US South. It was also a period in which, and I think this often happens in ethnic neighborhoods, where the Jewish population, while far diminished and leaving very rapidly, doesn't disappear all at once. And what's more, because it doesn't disappear all at once, many of its institutions are still here. So the things that draw people to shop, the things that draw people to uh, uh, worship, the things that draw people to be involved in social service agencies, they're all still connected here. You know, and those all have, you know, the Biela Stocker Home for the Aged down the street, the forward was still functioning. You know, much of the educational alliance is still here. All of those Jewish institutions formed in an earlier time are still playing a role for the community. Ironically, sometimes communities end up looking more ethnic as their populations become less so, you know, because to some degree, the sale of ethnicity you know, becomes the business, you know. And to some extent that was true in the Orchard Street uh, garment industry, it was certainly true a few blocks away on uh, Mulberry Street with Italian immigrants, where things became more sauce-scented and, and, and deliberately ethnic at a time when that suddenly becomes, when the business becomes, uh, let's sell the ethnic experience to people who are now living in the outer boroughs and the suburbs. So part of the great thing about the expansion to 103 is to bring that period in and of course that meant that there were some new Jewish immigrants and refugees still coming through and a lot of people who hadn't because people don't all leave at once who hadn't left yet you know although of course it was an aging population the other interesting thing about bringing it into the 102 period, three period um, is that in looking at those migrants of the 1940s and 50s, uh, Puerto Rican migrants, Chinese migrants. Um, well, it's not, let me put it this way, um, to a great extent, their story is not just the story of immigration itself. And when we talk about immigration, we're always focusing on, you know, who gets in, why they get in, what are the economic effects of them getting in, what are the legal ramifications, et cetera, et cetera. But, the world that was being go that was taking place at that period was very much dominated by the story of the children of immigrants. Okay, because almost everybody in a neighborhood like this at this point were the children of immigrants if they weren't immigrants themselves. Right, so. I think in many ways that's a story, well, it's a story that has fascinated me and I've written about it fairly extensively. 
But it's, I think, very much the story of New York. Very often, we think of immigration as the story we're looking for the exotic roots of people who are from different places. And that's, of course, part of what makes New York New York. But I think a very def important factor in defining New York's culture has always been what happens to the people who are betwixt and between? What happens to the people who have immigrant parents, you know, and therefore their parents are in many ways fairly poor guides to how to function in this society, okay? Because they grew up in another society. So the people that we typically look at and say, okay, tell me how to be an adult. You know, tell me how to manage my life as a functioning independent adult. And immigrant parents very often are particularly bad at that um, because they learn to do that in a different society. And they're struggling with that too. And so that struggle is very much one that uh, the huge swath of the population in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, the period that we're talking about here, would have been involved with. Okay? Um, and I guess one of the things that gets me very interested in people who are in that situation is the extent to which, well, people in immigrant communities and people who serve immigrant communities and other people who are involved uh, thinking about the problem of immigration often point to the children of immigrants and say, well, this is the problem. These folks are betwixt and between. In Germany, they have a nice phrase for this. They talk about people falling between two stools, which is a kind of ugh, ugly image, but you get, you get the idea. Um, you know, the, the people who don't really get, aren't functioning in one, one set of norms or the other. And therefore, they're losing their roots, they're losing their morals, they're not what we are, and yet they're not quite fully a part of the mainstream society either. You know, And I think there's probably more benefit to being betwixt and between than we normally think about. I think betwixt and between is a difficult space. It's a hard space. It is really difficult in relations between kids and adults. It's really difficult on the relationship uh, between kids and kids of other groups. But it's often a very creative space. And I think it's very often a space in which people think about how to remake who you are. And in America, but particularly in New York and particularly in the Lower East Side, a very large portion of the population is sitting in that space. Okay. And were in the 1940s and 50s, even though the immigrant experience for many of them was already quite a bit, you know, was, was uh, now several decades in the past by that time. This I think is really interesting for me for another reason. Because if you look around at New York right now, a very large portion of the population is in that space. You know, the children of immigrants outnumber the children of natives or recent immigrants themselves. Okay? They're about 40% of the population. And there are much higher numbers, not 40% of the population, what's it? Well, minus 37. 18 teens. Well, well, no, well, the, um, no, I misspoke. Of the young adult population. Okay. okay. Um, the, the trick here, for those of you not following the social science, <laughs> is how you calculate young children. Yeah, so there's lots of young children in the, in, in the situation. You know, if you are, you know, a person under age, if you're a person over age 50 today in New York, it's real easy to walk around like you're in a black, white Puerto Rican city. You know, if you're 25, it doesn't look that way. You know, the children of immigrants are, in that age group, really the modal category. Okay? And I think it affects, in some ways, the whole city um, in really fascinating ways. And I think it creates a kind of a creative space in the city as a whole to have so much of the population who are in that betwixt and between states, who my parents came from somewhere else, but that's okay because I, I'm here and I'm also transforming what here means. And it's hard to find a place that's more, that that's more evident than in New York at the present moment, or for that matter, on the Lower East Side. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you did a great job betwixt and between Nancy and Margaret. <laughs> All right, I'm lucky actually because they've said a quite a number of things. So I'm going to forward ahead a couple slides. I think you already saw the slide, 
But before I actually start, I want to say thank you again for Annie and everybody um, inviting me here. And I actually love working here as well, mostly because I, um, I'm a daughter of a garment worker. And I really enjoy talking about the garment industry and especially about the garment industry in the old place. And I'm enjoying learning and trying to figure out where Mrs. Lau fits in into this whole story as well. So to start, I'm going to actually start from um, World War II. And I'm going to try to tie together the garment industry, the growth of the garment industry, the changing population, the changing um, and growth of Chinatown, and then finally talk about the garment workers all in 10 minutes. Try fast, OK, fast, right? So, so after World War II, I'm going to start after World War II, after the Exclusion Act, but after World War II. So after World War II, there were shortages of Jewish and Italian workers and in the garment industry, so they created a lot of opportunities for non-white groups. That included the blacks and the Puerto Ricans, as well as Chinese Americans. And we forget that actually there were Chinese Americans here after World War II. And the apparel industry, for the most part after that time, was unionized. So that was a good job for all of these folks, Puerto Ricans, um, blacks, as well as for the Chinese. Now, native-born Chinese Americans made their first entry industry during the 1940s and 50s. They entered both as sewers and as garment shop owners. There were a few Chinese women that I actually spoke to who actually worked with Jewish or Italian owners, but they did work with other Chinese shops, in Chinese shops. In 1940, just to give you a uh, look at the numbers and the changing population, there were six Chinese men for every Chinese female here in New York City. In, uh, there, were on, there were only 12,000 Chinese here in 1940, but there were Chinese here. Um, after World War II, many Chinese women entered the U U.S. as a result of the War Brides Act of 1945 and the Chinese War Brides Act of 1946, specifically. These women were married to members of the U.S. Armed Forces, and Chinese American men actually served in World War II in both segregated and non-segregated units. And in those early years, um, the, these brides comp comprised 82% of the Chinese immigration stream during those years right after the war. Okay, so it was mostly women coming in. And as a result, they needed to find work. So, just to compare, just have a number in your head, by 1960, there were only 33,000 Chinese in the New York City area. So 20 years later, you almost triple the number of Chinese. So the first Chinese who actually owned garment factories in Lower Manhattan were ambitious. In 1950, there were only three or four shops, from what I can um, gather from my research and from other literature. By the mid-1950s, the number grew to about 15 shops in the Lower East Side and Chinatown by mid-1950s. And by my interviews with former garment workers, these owners were actually the American-born. They were the American-born sons and daughters of Chinese parents who were actually laundry and shopkeepers, the very few that were here. These sons, mostly, were actually GIs. They used their GI benefits to actually buy these shops. And they were encouraged by their parents not to do anything in the laundry because, guess what, they invented the washing machine. So their businesses were going to go out. So you should actually go into garment work. And these early factories were actually created in an effort to duplicate the success of their Jewish neighbors and to provide opportunities for the American-born and actually the new brides coming to the country. So from about 1969, 23% of Chinatown residents that were interviewed by a Columbia University study were actually working in the garment industry. And this proportion continued to increase as women came into the country. Um, the Chinese owners easily recruited their co-ethnics via word of mouth. And in turn, the women wanted these jobs for a variety of reasons. So let's see. Right. So the Chinese women did not only see these jobs as a means for an income, but also as a way to get health insurance, vacation benefits, sick pay, as well as other benefits for themselves and their families via the old-time ILGWU, International Ladies' Garments Workers' Union, which is now known as Unite or Unite Here. Okay? So the Chinese men that they were married to, for the most part, had no union benefits. They worked in the restaurant industry for the most part. So it was they relied on the women to bring in the benefits for the family. 
So throughout the 1960s through the, through the 1990s, the Chinese membership in the ILGWU grew despite declines in the other sections. By 1971, Local 2325, with membership that was mostly Chinese, was the largest affiliate of the ILGWU. And that was true through the very end. And that Local 2325 was concentrated down here in the Chinatown era. So throughout the 1970s and 80s, the garment industry with Chinese women remained the most robust out of all of the, um, of all of the sections. In fact, um, it actually kept garment industry in New York City and actually kept a large portion of garment uh, sewing here in the U.S. as well. So I'm actually going to move forward. So here I just want to show you a little bit about the growth of Chinatown and what happened at the same time as you can see. So this is like that middle period. I didn't go past 1990 in this slide. So this is the middle period. So the first slide I think is 1898. And you can see Chinatown was just a few blocks. But as population, as that statistic showed you, people walked to work. These shops were actually quite easy to open. In fact, the square, as Italians and the Jews moved out, north of the Canal Street area, the Italians moved out, and south to the east side, as the Jews moved out, they actually could use those spaces for homes as well as spaces for garment factories. And in fact, at that point in time, by the mid-80s, it still only cost $1.50 per square foot to buy a loft to actually own a garment factory. So that's how come it was so easy for so many of these garment factories to actually start. Right, yeah, we lost our chance. We could have all been in the garment industry, right? That's right, we did. I know, I know. So, so, so because of that, you could actually walk next door to go to work. And those are the reasons, that's what's part of the reason why you actually saw the growth of Chinatown and the growth of garment factories in this era and you know, close to this area as well, I mean location as well. Okay, let me move on. So the Chinese immigration, I think I passed at that. So the Chinatown space, I did that. So let's move on to, okay. So here you actually, I wanted to show you a map of actually the garment shops during that same era, okay. So next door to where they lived, and you can actually see it going far into, I can't see the slide, down here. up to Prince Street, and as far down to almost South Street, right? Mott Street. So the garment shops were actually all over, north into Little Italy and way south. And so this is where, during the high point of um, the garment industry here was during the 1980s. And probably Mrs. Lau probably worked until that time. And she would have probably worked in one of among 500 garment shops with over um, 20,000 workers. So that, that was a lot. That was a lot at that particular point in time. And where she lived, she would just walk to work at that particular point in time. Okay. So the expansion of garment shops occurred along Canal Street, Broadway, reaching into Little Italy along Mulberry and Elizabeth, and extended into the Lower East Side along East Broadway and Allen Street. So between 1960s to the 1980s, the Chinese contractors could purchase a factory of 25 sewing machines for as little as $25,000 by making a down payment of six to $7,000. And that's a result of why the garment factories grew so much and why so many people came here to live. It was easy. So let's talk a little bit about, so when you have this conflation of people living and working so close together, it's actually an advantage for a lot of the women, for a lot of the garment workers, a lot of the women. So for the majority of the Chinese immigrant women, income from working in the garment shops was crucial for family survival. One garment worker told me, without the garment industry, I really couldn't imagine how my family would have survived. The majority of the women that I interviewed during the 1990s all knew already that they were going to work in the garment factory even before they left China. They knew that their sister or aunt or cousin was going to bring them to their shop and basically ask the co-ethnic shop owner to let them in to sit at an empty seat. So long as those shops had a seat open, they could remain in there to sew to sew a whole garment, in fact. 
She could practice all day long as long as she could. And if she could actually sew one or two garments, she would be paid for that particular piece. And that might have been $20 for two or three garments at the time. And then she, until she could make the minimum wage, she would be a member of the union. So these women in these particular shops, because they were being, being paid piece rates, they could actually bring their kids to school, go to work, leave for lunch, and come back. And so in this particular picture, you actually see her combining this. You weren't supposed to bring kids to work, but she actually did. And here you can see the little child. He's playing with one of the spools, the inside of one of the spools, the containers. OK? So but anyways, to end, actually, you have to think about the balance. You have the shops here close to work, close to where they live, and you actually have all the things they need for going to grocery stores, flexible hours. So all of it worked. As an early, you know, if you think about flexible time for women and work, that's what you actually had. Okay, thank you. Um, that was perfect. And again, I think I know they know so much. There's so much they're not telling you. And the way that they're able to think on their feet and be able to distill this information is really amazing. Um, so I want to very quickly, again, go over the families that lived here and then have you hear from the families themselves in the sense that in the past few weeks and months, we've been conducting a lot of, of video, inter video taped interviews with the former residents of 103. Um, and I'm going to share with you those. Before I do, just very quickly, um, this is a picture of 97 or uh, 103 Orchard, rather, or 81 Delancey, this building. Um, in 1940, one of the tax photos that was collected, and this is really, again, this is in the middle of the middle period. And uh, again, the whole period we're dealing with is this in between, betwixt and between period. <laughs> but we have so much going on, and this really is a time of the Lower East Side that is not documented. This book, uh, this room during the day is filled with books about the history of New York, the history of the Lower East Side, and there are so, there's n almost nothing on this time period. So this exhibit that we're doing in many ways is, is pulling together a lot of different ideas about the Lower East Side. And so um, maybe one of you can go out and then write that book. But we'll start here with the exhibit first. Um, and so we see this building in uh, the 1940s, a period in which many people have left. But as Nancy has brought up, many are arriving. Um, this is uh, Coleman and Regina Epstein, who survived World War II. They met in a displaced persons camp in, in Zilsheim, which was outside of Frankfurt. Both had lost their families. He had been married with a child. Um, she also had been married, and, and they lost almost their entire families, but met in the displaced person camp. And as part of a directive issued by Truman, there was a kind of an allotment of a, just a thousand, and we don't want to make a big deal out of this because a thousand was not a lot when you compared it to the hundreds of thousands of people who wanted to get into this country. But in large part, for a number of reasons, they were in that first group. Um, Coleman had a, an uncle, um, Jacob Epstein, that ran a dress shop up the block on Orchard Street, and and. They, through the help of the relatives and, and the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, were able to come through. They came, had children pretty quickly, Bella and Bluma, and by 1955 moved into this building. This is Ramanita Saz. Um, she came in 1955 from Puerto Rico. Um, she came in search of economic opportunity um, for a number of reasons. A lot of jobs that had been available to people in Puerto Rico were, were closing in the area where she lived and in many parts. She came with two young sons, and she came here because she knew there was a Puerto Rican population here that she could rely on and, and get help from, in a sense. Um, she lived on the Lower East Side with these two boys and also worked in the garment industry. Every single family we're going to be talking about in this building had ties to the garment industry. Coleman Epstein helped his, uh, eventually took over his uncle's dress shop. Ramanita worked in the shop with Puerto Rican women. And um, Mrs. Lau and other Chinese women who lived in this building worked in garment shops. So th this is the, that's the thread that connects a lot of these stories. Um, we know from memories of her son, Jose, who we've spent a lot of time with, and you'll hear from him soon, 
She, her, her appearance was very important to her as well. She had clothes um, and she also had her, we look at this where her hair is so perfect and I especially am like, well, how'd she get her hair like that? And how is it nice like that every day? So she had a beauty parlor, it was a wig and the beauty parlor did the hair. So then it was, so she, she that was her, her method. There's much more to her story than that. Um, but this is just the little things that help us tell the stories. That TV set is gonna be really important for the story we're gonna hear from her son in just a moment. Um, and this is Su Hao Lao and her family in Hong Kong before they came here. She came in 1976. She had an older brother who was already here. I'm sorry, she came in 1975. She had an older brother who was already here in Queens, brought her actually over to Queens first, but in 1976 found an apartment through connections in this building and she moved here. And the reason she said she moved here because it was close to her job and cheap. It was cheap. So she could move here with her three, all, uh, three younger children. She had three older children still in Hong Kong who were, past, who were older than 18. And since she was here a couple of years, then was able to send for them. At one point, she has said she had 10 people living in her apartment. So, um, and as we said, working in the garment industry. So that's just an overview. There's so much here, and already there's so much to connect the broad scope. But I want to go back to our idea of objects. How do we root all these things together? How do we get the big picture? How do we get the family story? Um, and how do we make that apparent to our visitors and our educators? Um, and oh, I know where they are. <laughs> I'm doing too many computers. So the daughter of the refugees who grew up, and this was recorded three weeks ago upstairs in the apartment she lived in. So we actually got to see and film her entering this apartment for the first time. And this is her talking about um, a record player. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that clip a little bit more in just a few seconds, but I just want to end with, I want to point out she is American. She was born here on the Lower East Side. But somehow this record player that allowed her father to connect to a distinctive Jewish tradition in a, in a new way through the record player, she used the same machine to get to Paul Anka, and there was no conflict between it. And this is a great lead in, you know, not just... Um, I saw a lot of people nodding their heads when Paul Inca came up, or even just with the, you guys are too young, but the, but the record player lifting up the, the, the needle and moving it. Um, a lot of the school children that visit here have similar stories about music their parents like, or music they like, and things like that. So um, I just wanted to drop that seed in your head. And now I'm going to play Jose, who's talking about TV stations. Um, and this is from an interview conducted by Yadira Perez, who's been working with us, and this took place in, in Puerto Rico just in July. <laughs> <laughs> 
had no cable, so you'd be watching local channels. Then after a couple of years, I think 60s or 70s, I think two Spanish channels came in that were transmitting from New Jersey. And so in order to get those channels, you had to go buy a little box. They said, buy the little box and you'll get channels 41 and 47, which were Spanish channels. They said, you're in New York, there's no Spanish channels. That was a big, great thing. Spanish channels in New York, you go buy the box, connect to the antenna, boom, you watch channel 41 and 47 in Spanish. So that was the number one thing at that time. And so we watch regular television programs, but after that time, I said, we have one television, what show can you watch? The Spanish channel, because your mother would want to watch the Spanish channel. You know? Which was good, because that kept you bilingual. Learn your English in school, in the streets, and your parents will talk to you in Spanish. Like today, you have a lot of kids in New York who don't speak Spanish. <laughs> That's just a, a little bit of the material we've been collecting. And again, one of the reasons why, and I'm going to invite the, the scholars to come up and sit on a stool, not fall between the stools, but to stay, stay seated, rooted on the stools. And um, one of the reasons why we're focusing, again, a lot on objects is that we want to be telling these stories on a, through a virtual tour. And so the idea, very quickly, is that you click on this object, you hear the story from Bella, you hear the story from Jose, and then you click again, and you hear from them. <laughs> so here's your opportunity to see a little bit of this live, and then we're also excited to kind of hear your thoughts and your observations as well. So we'll open it up to everyone in just a few minutes. But for now, come, right, come on up. And um, we have clips of Mrs. Lau as well. Um, I just couldn't get it organized fast enough. But um, Margaret has seen those clips too, so um, she can bring those up. Um, so one of the things, oh, first let me just ask you if there are anything that you saw in those clips that you want to talk about right away, or any uh, observations from those clips that connect to your work, or, or points that you would like us to make in this exhibit. Mm -hmm. I think the idea mm -hmm. about the kids speaking English, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. idea of the, you know, what mm -hmm. the, the role of children mm -hmm. um, are, or what they think of all the objects are pretty important. Mm -hmm. So I think you should bring that into the... Yes, and I should have mentioned too that a lot of the, the tour will be told from the perspective of the children, of the immigrants or migrants, mm -hmm. because as I said earlier, that, that these are the, the children are the ones who s we're getting most of the stories from. So we want to be very clear, and like we're sharing you the ch with, we, with you the children's version of these events. Um, and that's a commonality that links these three stories together as well, in addition to the, the garment industry being one. So telling all of these stories from the perspective of the children is, is key. Oh, um. You know, some of the themes that we discussed earlier didn't come out, so maybe can I yes. raise some of those? Because one of the things that actually we've discussed a lot in, in mm -hmm. meetings has been the interaction of the people from different groups with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's something that um, is, I think, really that this brings out in a really good mm -hmm. way and a very, that's something that social scientists and sociologists like mm -hmm. all of us um, are, are trying to sort of figure out what happens when people live in these neighborhoods with members, you know, of different groups. Do they talk, you know, we know about, we have information on residential segregation, we have information about, you know, who lives next to whom, but we really don't have much about what goes on in their actual day-to-day -day interactions. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about 103 is that here you have this Chinese family and a Puerto Rican family, and he's the super, right, mm -hmm. and you have this Jewish family from, you know, who's mm -hmm. fled the, you know, have been through the Holocaust in, mm -hmm. in Europe. And actually they do have some, inter and, and they're mm -hmm. going to school. You hear that they have interactions with each other. They're not becoming best friends, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're having positive interactions mm -hmm. and getting along. What some sociologists call commonplace diversity, which mm -hmm. is this phrase of trying to get at how people in their day-to-day -day lives become used to those in other ethnic mm -hmm. groups. They become tolerant. They become, mm -hmm. it becomes something every day. And so I think, and that comes out, it will come out more when you talk about the children because they're going to school with each other and staying in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was 
that's one of the things that we've talked about a lot in talking about the, the, yeah. the apartments and the people who live in them. And really quickly there, one of the ways we're able to tell that story very well with Jose, again through an object, is we have a Boy Scout book. Jose was a member of a Boy Scout troop, and the reason the way he got to this building was because one of his fellow scout members or troop members was a boy named Eddie Salerno who was Italian American and Eddie Salerno told him oh there's an apartment available where I live you should move in and then Jose went to talk to his parents and then they moved in and then that's how he eventually became the super. So these um, co commonplace diversity or canopies, what are the canopy? Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan canopies play out in very concrete ways that shape people's lives. Had it not been for that Boy Scout group, Eddie and Jose might not have met and they might not, he might not have wound, out, wound up in this building. And we also have a wonderful um, PS42, which is just a school around the corner in Hester Street, was built at the height of Jewish and Italian immigration, but by the 1960s was extremely diverse. We have Jose's, I think it's his first grade or second grade mm -hmm. class, and it is like, you know, it's a Benetton commercial, mm -hmm. almost, but it, it's Benetton for the, for the early 60s in yeah. the sense that there's, it's Chinese, it's Puerto Rican, it's Italian, it's Jewish, and, and they're just all in a second grade class together there. So, day-to-day -day cos commonplace diversity or cosmopolitan <laughs> canopies. I mean, that's what this is in very real gritty ways. And Jose also talks about that with regard to the smells coming from the air shaft. He says, I know what the guy, Chinese guy downstairs was cooking just by opening my window. Um, and so smells are incredibly important. And it's not, and tasting foods, you might then taste a food because you've smelled it. Um, so, this diversity, I'm really glad that you brought that up, Nancy, because it's, it's huge for this. And I'm sorry, Phil, I was like... No, I, I was just going to follow up on that. And um, I think very often social scientists, mm -hmm. we have really, really good data on where people live. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the United States Census, we can tell you a lot of the characteristics of the residents of a place. We rarely have really good data of how they relate to the place or interact in the place. Mm -hmm. You know, so what's really fascinating about mm -hmm. this kind of project and looking at actual objects and things like that is you don't just get, well, this is what the population looked like residentially, but you get some idea of what, what, that, what the place meant to them, how they relate to each other, the kinds of things that really standard social scientific data is actually quite bad at. I, I would caution and say that it's, it's important to think about in moments of extreme diversity, and if you look at the city today, there are neighborhoods now that have just unprecedented levels of diversity with very, very different kinds of people living close by each other. There are also historically are patterns where certain groups are left out of that. Okay. Um, and African Americans particularly have been more segregated than other groups. So I think sometimes when we think about, the, the, there's a narcissistic thing that whites tend to do, which is to measure diversity as terms of like them or us, you know. And integration is how many of us there are versus how many of other people there are kind of thing. And today in New York, there are huge number, swaths of places that are incredibly diverse, but virtually lack whites. There are also places that are incredibly diverse, sometimes including whites, but have very, very few blacks, you know. And, so, and it's sometimes you can mistake that because, I mean, is Stuyvesant High School very diverse or very segregated? Segregated. Right, if you're looking at the number of African Americans. If you're looking at the actual national origins of everybody who shows up there, it's, it's amazingly diverse. Yeah, it's, these are, what, well, more Chinese than anything else. It's heavily Asian. No, well, Asian is a pretty, Asia's a big place. Um, <laughs> It doesn't have many Latinos either. Yeah, but very few Latinos, very few, and almost no African Americans. The huge numbers of whites from various places, of, of Asians from all kinds of different places. So, you know, the diversity versus segregation thing really is something we have to be really careful about. Now, I, I, just one quick exception. What made the Lower East Side a little different is the fact that because of the large concentration of public housing, while there were never a lot of African Americans, there were always some, or have been some since the 40s because of the public housing population, but in the private market housing, almost none. And one, I mean, this is just coming from the stories of the families, too. Bella, Bella's first friend, 
um, was a girl named Barbara, and she didn't know her last name because um, it was a girl she met at the park, and she knew where she lived because she would call up to her, and her mother helped her call up to her. <laughs> she was an African-American girl that lived there. Her first friend was African-American. The mother, um, who had come from Europe and, and never seen, probably had never seen many African-Americans until she came to New York. This is totally fine. This is a wonderful thing. Her, uh, uh, Bella's other friend is, a, is an Italian-American girl. So there's a lot of kind of this, again, commonplace diversity coming up and there's ways we can kind of touch on that. But I want to, and, and then I will open it up to the audience, I want to flip a little bit to a caution that Nancy has said before and Phil has said before and I'm sure Margaret would caution us as well is that even as we're talking about commonplace diversity and how wonderful that is and how we don't get too carried away by talking about oh it's so wonderful diversity and forget about discrimination that exists even on the Lower East Side or, or other places and we I spoke yesterday with Virginia Sanchez Corral a historian of the Puerto Rican migration and she really brought Romanita to life in a way by talking about, I said, well, how would Ramanita have experienced discrimination? And she said she would, she, on the Lower East Side, not that much. In fact, she chose to live in the Lower East Side because she could have a Puerto Rican ne network. She could have a church. She could have a place to work with other Puerto Ricans. She could have the institutions that she needed. She could have the food available, the groceries she needed. But she knew that if she left this neighborhood, that if she moved to another neighborhood, the discrimination was right there, right? And I think I'm seeing a lot of nodding of heads. We all know that people in New York, whether they're coming in 1880 or 1910 or 1950, or 1980 or today make choices based on neighborhoods that give them an area where they can live in, feel comfortable in a certain diversity, but that doesn't mean there's no discrimination. And that's, that's a kind of tension we have to play with and how we work that into an exhibit in natural ways. Um, and I think, if, do you mind actually for the questions, just because um, for hearing, every, not everyone can hear so well, if you mind coming up right here to the... It's actually good. Everyone wants to see you. Oh, absolutely. And you, have to put it, and you have to put it down two feet. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been addressed by anybody, and I'm kind of curious about, mm -hmm. is we've talked about the immigrants, and we've talked about the children of immigrants. But what about their children? Many of us represent, you know, the, uh, yes. not the children, but the grandchildren. Let me take that, just because that's a great segue into someone I wanted to actually be the first thing. So. We started with objects of people. Jason Eisner is the grandchild of immigrants. Christine, great-grandchild. Son. 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 That's right. He's from Germany. OK, I'm that's right. He's from, OK. But um, Nancy is a grandchild. Of, a grandchild of yes. Um, Christina Chan is the granddaughter. Um, and the child of immigrants. There, but it can be both, right? Because on one side, you can have one, right? OK. I am the great grandchild of immigrants all, on every count. Um, Margaret is the daughter, daughter and, gra and, and granddaughter. Right, because mm -hmm. my father's a one, could be 1.5. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. well, and Phil, true. grandchild, right? Grandchild. Grandchild. So what we're doing with this website and activities at the museum is we're collecting the stories of people who are both immigrants, Ch children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. Like, I want some woman in Minnesota to send me her the lace doily that her Scandinavian great 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 grandmother made and have a story that she can link because one of the things we're trying to get at is despite child, grandchild, great grandchild, great 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 great, what are these stories that we have and, and how are they made meaningful to us in, in different ways? And the way we make that concrete is through objects. So last week when Sam Roberts told the history of New York in 101 Objects, we invited the, the visitors, the guests of that to come think of an object that tells their stories. And I will qualify, Sam Roberts, a lot of his objects were actually documents. Oh, so um, Mitchell Grubler is here today to share, and the grandchild of immigrants is gonna share one of those objects. So come on up, Mitchell, and. Oh, what's this object? Oh, okay. Okay. That's good. <laughs> I'm actually the son of an immigrant. Um, and um, uh, what I have is a uh, document uh, it's an insurance, a life insurance uh, certificate 
uh, for my maternal grandfather. His name was David Knopp, uh, and the uh, Knopp family uh, came from a shtetl uh, in what was Austria-Hungary before World War I, and then uh, after World War I became part of Poland. Uh, the shtetl was called um, Strelisk or Streliska, uh, and then um, it's now part of the Ukraine. Um, and so my maternal grandfather was born in 1893, and he came here in 1912, which I learned not very long ago. Um, and it was the year that my mother was born. Uh, and they lived in um, her grandmother's house, which had a thatched roof and a dirt floor. And as a little girl, she remembers sleeping in a little shelf area that was above the oven because it was warm for a young uh, child to sleep there. And she remembers sweeping the dirt floor with the broom and making patterns with the broom. In any case, and they, um, they made money because the house was on the market square and they would sell tea and cakes to the farmers who brought their produce there. And they also had a cow and sold the milk. Anyway, uh, David Knopp uh, came in 1912 and he's listed as a tailor and sometimes a maker. And um, what's interesting about the insurance document is that they kept moving around all, almost all on the Lower East Side. And there's about uh, six different addresses, and they're all crossed out until the uh, last one. Uh, so the first one is just listed as um, New York City. Um, uh, looks like he took it out in 1926. Uh, then that's crossed out, and there's a 332 Delancey Street. And then that's crossed out, and there's a 168 Ridge Avenue. Um, and then that's crossed out, um, and there's one that's a little bit difficult to make out. And then that one's crossed out, and it's 30 Pitt Street. Uh, and then 187, um, oh, then they moved to New Jersey. <laughs> and it's Passaic, New Jersey. <laughs> and then the last one uh, looks like where he died, which was in Gouverneur Hospital here on the Lower East Side. So it looks like um, they did collect on this um, $2,000 uh, policy. That's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much, Mitchell. And I just, again, this is a distinct story, right, of, of Mitchell's grandfather, David, coming and his work in the garment industry and a lot of movement. And this is happening in the 1920s, and the document is from 1926. Jose is 40 years later, 50 years later. He comes. His mother works in the garment industry. They move many times before they actually move into this building. So, again, my point here is by li looking at all these objects and different documents, we get particular stories, but when we look at them all together, we're also able to see what are common experience. So that was a wonderful introductory question that led into Mitchell's wonderful document. Um, but now we have a few minutes also to take more questions from, from the audience. Uh -huh. Actually, if you want to come up. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming and talking about this. I just have a question about um, the diversity in New York. Um, so there is no overwhelmingly dominant group um, or immigrant group in New York, which is striking compared to other American cities. Um, and I wanted to know what factors contribute to that and also main maintain it. What attracts this diversity from all over the world? Well, I mean, the big way that New York differs from many other cities in the U.S. is that we don't have this enormous Mexican population. I mean, Mexicans are 30 about 30 percent of all immigrants in the United States today, and there are cities like Houston and Los Angeles 
um, and Chicago, where Mexicans are 40% or more of the immigrant population. And although there's a growth in the Mexican population in New York City, there's still 6% of the immigrant, po just 6% of the immigrant population. So, I mean, one, why is that? I mean, one reason, you know, compared to Los Angeles was part of Mexico, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's a historic relation and because of location. Um, Chicago also has a history of Mexican immigration, by the way. So I think part of it is historical reasons that, um, and, you know, New York has received immigrants from the Caribbean for a long time. So part of it is that these groups, Chinese, have been here. I mean, there have been a lot of groups that have had small numbers that have been here before and have come, um, we, we get, I mean, New York does stand out for its enormous diversity in having uh, people from, you know, Asian, Latino, uh, white, black immigrants in large numbers that you don't find in many other cities. Yeah, I, I also want to say that I think there's a lot of opportunity that people perceive that they can have in New York City, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can start off very, you know, in a, a low paying job and then move your way up or at least have opportunity for their kids here, that they actually have more, and this is particularly true for the Asian families, more so than in California. They find that they think the image is that New York it has more opportunity. Part, part of this is also um, being far from the border and harder to get into. Yeah. Um, not only was New York not dominated by one flow, but New York uh, has a smaller undocumented population than other parts of the country, which probably is helpful for a lot of immigrant incorporation reasons. That having been said, the undocumented population is growing, and that's a real problem uh, in, in terms of the way the children of immigrants are incorporated. Um, but even the unauthorized population here tends to be living in mixed status families, as Nancy's written about a lot and not be kind of an isolated, uh, segregated group. And I think that that tends to probably facilitate, you know, this kind of diversity. In terms of origins of it, a lot of it has to do with the fact this was always a trade center. Mm -hmm. So even long before some of these groups grew in large numbers, there were small populations of Chinese here and West Indians here and Puerto Ricans here, going back to the end of the 19th century which of course could be the seeds for larger populations, largely because they were people um, who were directly involved in trade, you know, with folks at the other end. Yeah, um, yeah I should just say one of the things about, and again, diversity, because Phil was mentioning there are about half a million, the estimate is about half a million undocumented. But again, unlike other U.S. cities or many other gateway cities where the undocumented population, again, is overwhelmingly Mexican, yeah, here, again, it's a diverse, undocumented population. And one could also say that the very diversity of New York kind of breeds more diversity mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the way the immigration system works. You know, people send for their relatives, something like two-thirds of the immigrants who come to the U.S. or who are, get a, or a permanent resident visa are, are, um, are doing it through family. And so, you know, you have diverse immigrants here, then you're going to have more diversity, you're going to have right. more coming. So New York, you know, does have that diversity. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Can I just have one? Uh, I wanted to say yes. one thing because Margaret started off saying how, you know, her mother was a garment worker. So I just have to say one thing because the Lao, one of the Lao daughters went to my high school. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I went to her high school. Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> She, but she went, she traveled, actually it was rather difficult for her. Her mother sent her, I went to Bayside High School, you all know Bayside, right, in Queens, and it's a subway and a bus, right, and she, she, she was sent there, so that, that's my connection, right, I just said. <laughs> so, um, again, I want to. No, total. No, she was almost there around the same time. We'll do, um, I think it's, we're, we're, we're running on 8 o'clock, so this is a longer tenement talk than usual, but I want to thank all of you for um, having the, the patience to kind of think, listen to us think out loud about this exhibit in many ways, and to kind of consider the many components that we have in the creation of an exhibit, not just, you know, there's the 103 stories of the residents. There's a story of the building. There's a story of the neighborhood. There's a story of the neighborhood and what it represents. The story of New York City and what it represents as an immigrant city in the nation. Um, and then you have objects and you have people and you have stories and, and all of it. So 
and generations, exactly. So I want to invite you to keep coming to these. We'll be doing these you know, every semester or so to kind of give an where we are with this exhibit. But in the meantime, I think there are cards on your seats where we are inviting you to tell your stories. And I would be, like, if I come to work tomorrow and there is an object story there for me, one of your stories, just like Mitchell shared from last week, I will be so happy. So just make me happy. I work hard. <laughs> Please send us your object stories. Thank you very much. And thank you, Nancy, Phil, and Margaret.